So another significant piece about early medieval Christianity is the development of what we call Carolingian Christianity. This uh, concerns the reign of the Emperor Charlemagne. So to orient ourselves towards this, let's think about a process that's happening in the Mediterranean basin as a whole. Uh, we move in the late antique period from a relatively unified Mediterranean world to a breakdown of the Mediterranean world into three different spheres. And I have a map that shows you this in a way that is a map of Europe and the Mediterranean world around the year 850. And here we can see to the east, the Byzantine Empire uh, centered on Constantinople. Uh, further then to the south and east is the uh, Islamic Caliphate, the Abbasid Caliphate that really stretches across all of the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, Syria, land of Palestine, Egypt, over across North Africa, then of course extending down to the Arabian Peninsula. And then we also have what we would call the Frankish Empire or the Papal Frankish Axis. That is this uh, trajectory from the length of Italy through Rome up over the Alps into uh, what we would now call Germany and then further west over into the Kingdom of the Franks, uh, what have been Gaul and what we would now call the country of France. What we have then is really then a fragmentation of the Roman world between the 6th and 9th century. Uh, and we have this happening in a couple of ways. One is there's ongoing theological controversies that exacerbate divisions between Latin-speaking and Greek-speaking forms of Christianity. There are disputes over ecclesiastical authority, especially about the authority of the Bishop of Rome in relationship to other uh Episcopal authorities, especially uh, the Patriarch of Constantinople. Uh, the expansion of Islam, as I've already mentioned, and then increasing localization of society as a result of this fragmentation. Of course, nature abhors a vacuum, and power centers do develop even in the context of this fragmentation. So let's think about the papal Frankish access then, or this alliance. This is a uh, political relationship that develops beginning in the year 751 when Pope Zacharias of Rome confirms Pippin as the king of Francia. Pippin is a son of Charles Martel, who had stopped the expansion of Islam up through the Iberian Peninsula at the Battle of Tours. And uh, Pope Zacharias is thus recognizing the role of the family of Charles Martel in helping to secure Christian territories. And so Pope Zacharias gets involved in confirming that Pippin is the legitimate heir of Charles Martel when he succeeds to the throne. Now, what happens is that around the same time, a Lombard king, Aestulf, Lombardy is this northern region of Italy, uh, enters uh, the ter Roman territories, seizes it, and is attempting to capture the city of Rome himself. A new pope comes onto the scene. His name is Stephen II. And he writes to Constantinople and attempts to get the Emperor Constantine V to help defend uh, the Roman territory. Now, one thing to know is that by this point in time, the Bishop of Rome has become the chief administrator of the Roman territories of central Italy because there is no one else who really has enough authority to hold everyone together. So the Pope is acting in both, in both ecclesiastical and civil ways in this time period. So because Constantinople is not helping, uh, Pope Stephen II appeals to Pippin, for aid, and they meet uh, uh, in 754 uh, around the Feast of Epiphany in the Kingdom of Francia. And there, Stephen consecrates Pippin as king. He's already been king, but this is sort of a, a, a royal anointing. Gives to Stephen the title Patricius Romanorum, or a patrician of Rome, which means that 
Stephen is symbolically made a leading citizen of Rome and help, and hence one with authority to govern or have a say in the governance of Rome. On his part, Pippin promises to preserve the rights of St. Peter, that is to uh, defend the claim of the authority of the Bishop of Rome, and to restore any papal lands that the Lombards, over uh, uh, on behalf of their King Astolf, have seized. In this uh, whole event, Stephen refers to Pippin as a spiritual co-father with him in relationship to Pippin's sons. That is, Pippin's sons are also Stephen's sons spiritually. So what emerges then is a kind of both political kinship and a spiritual kinship between um, the papacy and the dynasty of Charles Martel. And what emerges is what we call the Carolingian dynasty after Charlemagne, who is the son of Pippin. So this is a new alliance that's emerging, and it's emerging right as the papacy wants to begin to um, assert itself as the definitive leader of the Western church. What's also happening with this alliance is a new organization that's emerging ecclesially, and especially a number of significant synods are held um, under the auspices of the papacy during this time. During one of them, a Lateran synod, that is a synod held at the Church of St. John Lateran, or John inside the walls in the city of Rome, the Frankish bishops are invited to participate in this papal synod that usually only the bishops uh, in the immediate region of Italy would have attended. And what this does is draw the Frankish bishops into a broader tradition of the universal church. And they're also exposed to the, the grandeur of the liturgy of the papal court. And so the, the, thus the Frankish bishops take back ideas about what the church is and liturgical customs that further cement a linkage between the Frankish and Roman churches. And this thus means that papal authority begins to be recognized as more definitive in the region of the Franks, where it traditionally had had no legal jurisdiction. Before, there was only sort of a, a recognition of the spiritual authority of the Bishop of Rome, but not of any jurisdictional authority. But that is beginning to shape and shift during this period of time. Furthermore, this also, the Synod in particular of 769 begins to further reinforce an independence of the Bishop of Rome from Constantinople itself. So we again have lots of processes of a gradual emergence of a recognition of papal authority. Furthermore, then we want to think about the reign of Charlemagne himself. Charlemagne succeeds his father Pippin upon his death in the year 771. In 799, Pope Leo III is kidnapped by uh, the former administrators of the papal court of Pope Hadrian. Pope Hadrian had just died. Um, people in his circle had hoped that one of their own would be elected pope. None of them are. Pope Leo III is elected pope instead. And so there is a kidnapping of Pope Leo. Now, one thing to know is that one would be um, invalidated as a priest or bishop if one is maimed in any way, if one has any bodily maiming, uh, losing an eye, losing a hand, so on. Uh, this comes from a particular reading of the Levitical Codes. So there is a fear that Pope Leo is going to be rendered incapacitated as the Bishop of Rome because of this kidnapping. Charlemagne, uh, which stands for Charles the Great, uh, hears of this and he invokes the title of Patricius Romanarum that his father Pippin 
held, and he claims a hereditary linkage to that, and goes to Rome and um, restores Leo as the Bishop of Rome in October of 799. Uh, Charlemagne stays in Rome, and so on Christmas Day of the year 800, he is anointed as emperor by Leo III. This has deep symbolic resonance. There's not been emperor in the West for several hundred years by this point. This coronation uh, involves bringing in all kinds of representatives who live in Rome from other regions of the Christian world. So legates or ambassadors from Jerusalem. Uh, the Patriarch of Jerusalem actually has the banner of Jerusalem brought to the city of Rome. And here, uh, Charlemagne is beginning to assert himself as both a defender of Rome and as a universal defender of the Christian faith. And he begins to use the title of emperor to be understood in a global sense, not just as an emperor in the West, but as an emperor for all of Christ Christendom. And so in this way, he's really consciously imitating Constantine himself. And so again, we see his further strengthening of a Frankish papal alliance through this act of the co coronation of Charlemagne. Now, significantly, Charlemagne really takes his sense of a duty as a Christian monarch very seriously. And he especially is interested in a whole series of church reforms during this period of time. One of these notable things is an educational reform process that he introduces. So there is a whole circle of Carolingian court advisors and theologians during this time period. Uh, Paulinus, the Bishop of Aquileia, which is in Italy, is a famous grammarian. He helps to help preserve and ensure that the Latin language flourishes. Alcuin of York from uh, England, an Anglo-Saxon, who is perhaps the most prominent theologian of his era, is at the court of Charlemagne. And Paul the deacon, who is a homilist, that is, he collects and composes homilies, preserves uh, sermons from the past to be read and reflected upon. And he also writes a history of the Lombards, uh, which is similar in vain to Bede's ecclesiastical history of the English people. So what we have here also then is rising educational standards to ensure that the classical heritage of the Western Roman Empire is preserved. Uh, learning in Latin flourishes, a whole network of schools and sites of Christian learning is established, especially through a decree that Charlemagne passes called the Admonitio Generalis, or the General Instruction in the year 789, where he emphasizes the importance of standardized forms of education for clergy, ensuring that they understand Latin, even if it's not their uh, spoken language, understand how to do the liturgy properly, and how to uh, uh, say the prayers in Latin properly. And then there's also a, a real significance on the proper copying and production of church documents, uh, theologians, uh, church teachings of various kinds, to ensure that learning is sustained and that a long memory and a knowledge about what it means to Christian to be Christian uh, exists. So there's a whole culture of learning that Charlemagne ensures, and I think this really um, does a lot for us to push against the notion of this time period as a Dark Ages, as an era in which there is very little learning or education happening. I'd ag actually argue um, quite to the contrary, that this is actually an era of flourishing, that we can even call this a Renaissance period. This ri These rising educational standards um, flow out into other areas so that noble women um, have a high degree of literacy at this time, as do many nuns, and these two categories of noble women and nuns can often overlap also. Speaking about nobility, then, there's also a process of Christianizing 
uh, in this era, especially as Charlemagne comes to control Saxon territories to the east, uh, in what's now Germany. A lot of this area had not been thoroughly Christianized yet, and he is very concerned to ensure that um, the new cultures that he, uh, he helps to uh, rule are thoroughly Christianized. And one of the great examples we have for this is the poem, The Helions, which uh, you read uh, for the course, which is a ninth century poem in Old Saxon that uses the cultural idioms of Saxon culture um, to retell the gospel. And what we have in the Helions or the story of the savior is a harmonizing of the different gospel accounts into one single narrative. I just want to read a couple of the sections that I think show well how aspects of Saxon culture are introduced here. One is on page 271 in Coakley and Stirk, just the very beginning of the piece. There were many whose hearts told them that they should begin to tell the secret runes, the word of God, the famous feats that the powerful Christ accomplished in words and in deeds among human beings. There are many of the wise who wanted to praise the teachings of Christ, the holy word of God, and wanted to write a bright shining book with their own hands, telling how the sons of men should carry out his commands. So just to uh, hear this and to note that these are recorded as songs or uh, poems that are to be uh, performed, this notion of secret runes, uh, runic writing was a way of expressing uh, the will of the gods in Saxon culture. And so the gospels are turned into a vocabulary of runes. Uh, this is God's revelation, a special revelation about Christ. And also this reference to writing a bright shining book with their own hands. Uh, medieval manuscripts were highly valued in this time as uh, texts that through their very beauty could show forth something about what God wants for humanity. And so sacred text as a high value here in this document. On page 275 of Coakley and Stirk, there's another passage here where this is a paraphrase from the Sermon on the Mount in the middle there. Do not think for a moment that I've come to this world to destroy the old law, to chop it down among the people, and to throw down the word of the prophet. They were trustful men, clear in their commands. Heaven and earth, standing now united, will both fall apart before even a minute bit of their words in which they gave true commands to the people here goes unaccomplished in this world. I did not come to this world to fell the word of the prophets, but to fulfill them to increase them, to make them new again for the children of men, for the good of this people. Saxon culture is a culture that valued law, much like Frankish culture. And the Saxons are also identifying the narratives of the people of Israel as receiving law and God's will being revealed to them in the Christian message. And so this continuity between Old Testament and New Testament is a common theme that's emphasized in the conversion of the Saxon peoples. You notice also here, there's this language of the felling of the law as if it's being chopped down. Part of the conversion process in Saxon culture is the chopping down of sacred trees at which people had assembled to worship. And in their place, instead of the sacred tree, then is the wood of the cross. And so there's an intersection happening here as well that we want to think about. And finally, we can look at uh, two ways in which noble culture is also considered. In particular, on page uh, 274, he talks about, this is the beginning of this, uh, the uh, song 17. Thus he, Jesus, spoke wisely and told God's spell. The guardian of the land taught. His people with a clear mind, heroes were very eager and willing to stand around God's son intent on his words. They thought and kept silent. 
they listened to the chieftain of the people giving law to the nobly born. So this language of chieftain, hero, nobly born, is a sense of Christ as one who is the head chieftain, the one who comes to the warriors and tells them how to now live. So this is a warrior culture that is being converted. And so this language of of chieftain, army, soldier is embedded in this retelling of the gospel. And we see this even with the end on page 280 of Copley and Stirk, where the resurrection of Jesus is described. So it talks about the noble ladies uh, standing about, uh, and the angel speaks. I know that you're looking for your chieftain, Christ the rescuer, from a hill fort Nazareth, whom the Jewish people tortured, crucified, and though innocent, laid here in the grave. He is not here now. He has gotten up for you. This place, this grave, and the sand is empty. And then to the next paragraph. The pale women felt strong feelings of relief taking hold in their hearts. Radiantly beautiful women. When the angel, the all-ruler, said to them about their Lord was a most welcome message for them to hear. He told them to go back again from the grave and join to Christ's followers and to tell his warrior companions and soothsaying words that their chieftain had gotten up from death. And there's a sense of that he is going to come back, that he has, in a way, destroyed death. And uh, if we go to the very end here, it's that they say, you'll find never find him here in this rock grave now. He has already risen up in his body. You should believe this. Remember the words which he often said to you so truthfully when he was one of your companions in Galilee land. How he, the holy chieftain, was to be given over and sold into the hands of sinful, hate-filled men. That they would torture, crucify, and kill him. And that for the good of the people, he would get up alive on the third day by the chieftain's power. Now he's done all this. It's been accomplished among human beings. Hurry now, go forth quickly, and let his followers know. And so Christ is a warrior who is conquering death. And I have an image for you in Populi of, uh, from a medieval manuscript that shows Christ as a warrior with his head on the lion, on the head of a lion, and on a serpent, and he is thrusting a spear into the serpent's mouth. And in Latin, above there, it, it, it speaks uh, from Psalm 90, 13, that he will walk upon the asper, uh, upon the uh, serpent and the basilisk. He will crush under his heels the lion and the dragon. So this image of Christ the warrior, Christ the noble one, he comes to redeem his people. And here his redemption speaks in ways that are culturally expected. This is not the risen savior of first century Judaism. This is a risen savior for ninth century Saxony. And there's something we have to grapple with there in the ways in which the images of Christ have shifted and changed. And so we see then an effort of Christianization that aims first at the nobility and that creates a church for the nobility with the hope that the rest of the population will also follow. So I think here we have a lot to consider about who Christ is, about how conversion happens, and about how context informs understandings of who Christ is and what salvation is. So I hope we can have a productive conversation about those themes and about aspects of Carolingian Christianity in general when we get together. I look forward to talking.